What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Painless Wholesaling Podcast, where I bring on experts to talk about how they're crushing it in the real estate game so you can learn from them so you don't have to go through the pain yourself and trying to figure out your yourself. So today I have Brent Bowers on here, man. This is the land shark flipping genius. This guy knows how to do it all, and I want you to learn from him today. So Brent, congratulations on your massive success on flipping you just told me about one of your students that was crushing it tell me let's bring you on in tell us a little bit about yourself all right now that you you've literally made me feel amazing and made my head big i'm not an expert i'm not a genius i'm just a guy flipping land and there's a reason why i chose land because it's simple it's easy for me these houses and apartment complexes are complicated and like i am all about zero complexity i think that's why businesses fail but uh yeah i keep mean, it simple all right i started in real estate in 07 got crushed quit in 2009 basically was homeless in 2009 joined the military did a couple of deployments to afghanistan uh had a failed marriage uh met another beautiful lady uh married her we started having babies and guess what history was repeating itself so i was running from a problem Mm -hmm. That's why I jumped back into real estate. I found land because I heard some guy on a podcast saying he was doubling his money overnight. I was like, no way. It can't be that easy. And right. it is kind of that easy. It just takes work. Uh, it actually takes work, hard work sometimes. Of course. And, you know, I started buying and selling land, but I didn't, I didn't sell all of it for cash. I sold a lot of it for seller financing and that mm -hmm. allowed me to get out of the military. I haven't had a real job since 2018. Um, and I just I flip land. I flip land and I try and sell most of it on seller financing so I can have that. I'm going to do air quotes, passive <laughs> income. Everyone talks about the mailbox yeah. money and, you know, just having a great time doing it. That's amazing. So let me ask you about you sell it. You're saying you sell it on seller financing. So do you close on it yourself and own it? Um, do you like with do you buy all cash with cash and then you finance or do you do a, a wrap? Both. <laughs> okay. Both. Yeah, Both. I try and uh, I, I shoot to, to buy it and close on it myself and seller finance. But sometimes I have to wrap it. And let me just explain that to everyone. What I yeah. what, like, if I understand you correctly, when I wrap it is when the seller holds the financing for me when the seller mm -hmm. becomes the bank because here's the thing most banks don't lend on land so sellers of land landowners usually know that they got to sell it for cheap or they got to allow someone to make payments to them because you can't just go out and get bank lending now if we took mm -hmm. away all the bank lending at the price of everything would come down drastically right like cars and real estate and houses but when money's cheap the lending's cheap the prices go up. We just saw that the last couple yeah. of years, right? So true. Very true. So I've got a seller right now on a piece of land in Florida. He is allowing me to pay him for 15 years. The land's going to be in my name, but he's given me a 15 year mortgage at 5% interest. And he's also given me 180 days, six months to find my buyer ahead of time that Amazing. I can wrap. I just got a letter of intent from a buyer. They're going to, they're going to pay me for 30 years at 12% interest. His payments can be twenty two hundred a month to me and my buyer. I'm my seller. I'm going to pay him for fifteen years at five percent interest. His payments going to be eleven hundred a month. So I'm going to keep the down payment, the difference every month, and at the end, he's going to buy it for a little over eighty eighty something thousand more than what I have it. I am buying it for basically. Amazing, amazing. That that is that is so sweet, and and it's land, so you don't have to worry about the, the maintenance of the house or anything like that, right? Yeah, there's not even a road on it. I mean, literally the county road goes to the land. I literally have no repairs, no contractors, no unexpected expenses. It's the taxes. We just pay the taxes once a year. And then guess what? My buyer is going to pay those. Wow. He's he's willing to pay the ta the letter of intent guy you're referring to, correct? Exactly. Yeah. How did you find the buyer? Uh, guess what? I, I, I have a... so. I have a very specific way to find these, these uh, sellers. We send out what I call LOLs, land offer letters, or you can call them laugh out loud if you want, because mm -hmm. we just got a smoking hot deal. But I send land offer letters with a actual offer price on them. So how we, we do that is that allows me, we have a blurb in there that allows me to market that land on the MLS, market it all over. Um, and if anybody wants a copy of one of the letters that we're using, that's just crushing it or LOL, <laughs> go to the landsharks.com forward slash LOL. And you can download that thing. So there you oh, go. Okay, I think it's going to ask you for your name and your email, and then it'll send you an email. MailChimp will send you an email. But once we do that, we get that thing signed. I send it to my real estate agent, my land specialist 
real estate agent. He throws it on the MLS. So that's how we found the buyer. So you put it on the MLS without even owning it, correct? Exactly. And and here there's gonna be very careful doing that. Like you gotta have the right, you know, the the right blurb as well as the broker that's willing to do it, as well as the land specialist that understands land and make sure the seller knows what's going on. Because like you want to like explain to that seller, look, I'm not keeping this land. This is my business. You know, we market for buyers. And when the sellers are cool with it, like you've already explained it to them, it's good to go. But, but it's like if they if you catch them off guard and you're kind of like, you know, operating in Shady. the shadows and like, yeah, we're going to have a bunch of our partners and our contractors and all these people looking at bull crap. Like mm. just say you're a wholesaler. All right. Like love it. <laughs> love it. So what, what keeps that guy who just said, hey, yeah, market my deal, what keeps him from just doing it himself uh, since you just put it on the market to find your buyer? You know, I can hang blinds and curtains myself, but uh, we hired that out too. And I know the guy had a markup and he also picked up the curtains and the hanger, I'm sorry, and the blinds for us. Mm -hmm. And it's just speed and convenience. Like just choose what you want to do. These guys are, are, they're professionals. They're actually in they are professionals. They're in the law industry and they just didn't want to deal with it. And yeah. the only request they had was just don't let the neighbors know what, what we're selling it to you for. Okay. But wouldn't they know though, or, or you're listing at a price that doesn't, uh, obviously it's not the price that he's given to you for. Is that, is that what, how you're getting around exactly. that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. We're listing it at a higher price, about a hundred thousand higher. And you're not looking for cash, um, necessarily. You're looking to sell it on terms. Exactly. So okay. I'm getting a big enough down payment to cover my realtor fees, my closing cost, and the down payment to the seller. Amazing. So asking for ten percent down. Now, if he sees that a hundred k above, does he? Does that happen? Where he's like, "Why you got to list it for that much?" Has that happened or no? Uh, no, it's never happened. And I mean, they might have seen it. Like they, they, most of the time, they don't care. They don't care because they're most of the time landowners are very. Uh, like disengaged or uh, they're not attached. You know, a lot of like house sellers are very emotional about the house. You know, they've lived in it for 18, 20 years. They raised their family in it. And like, what are we told all these years? Our houses are your biggest investment. And what do investments do? They increase in price, right? Well, land, they're not being told that. Or they inherited the land sometimes, or they live out of state or they're behind on their taxes. So they're aggravated. Most of the time, they just want to get rid of it. Mm. Is there a certain, is it, is there like a limit to the amount of land out there where there's like kind of scarcity involved with land or not, not really, I don't really know much about land. You know, I think a lot of buyers think there's scarcity because they see the housing, you know, the house is blowing up and like houses being built everywhere in apartment complexes, there's scarcity, but there's over 3,300 counties and there's more land parcels available than there are houses and mobile homes and, mm. and storage units. There is so much more land available than house and mobile home and multifamily deals put together. So you might have that scarcity thought. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. lot of our a lot of our buyers do, so they want to snatch it up and buy it, but there's actually more available. And they wow. say buy land, they're not making any more of it. But technically, when we subdivide it, we are actually making more assessors parcel numbers. <laughs> right. Kind of. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Cause they're subdividing it as well. So let me ask you about the guy that's uh, planning on buying it with the, he's the letter of intent, but he's planning on buying the one you have. Yeah. Is he, is your seller wanting you to cover the payments before you close on it? Like, how's that working? He's just no. cool you paying him at one hundred after 180 days or 160 days, whatever, however long yeah, he we, gave don't, you. we don't have to close until right at that six month, six month mark. And I am fully prepared to close on it because I know the deal I have. I can, mm. I mean, I'm totally cool coming up with $15,000 as that that's down all, payment. Yeah, that's all it is. Wow. Yeah, it's 10%. almost seven acres. You can see the water. You can see the river from this land. And he said 10%, right? He won 10% down? Yep. So one uh, 15,900 down. Did you negotiate that from like a 20% or was he just wanting 10 and you're like, wow, this is a layup. There was a little negotiation in there. Um, there was a little back and forth. You know, he was a little concerned about the the purchase agreement. Like he wanted a couple like nuances changed in it. So, you know, generally you don't see that very often, uh, but on this particular deal, yes. And, and this is just one of many, like I'm just telling you my most recent, I just bought five acres yesterday in Daytona beach, Florida. Mm. Nice. For $153,000, five acres, very close to a Walmart, surrounded by multifamily. So the next call 
is going to be to the to the mayor and the city planner. And I'm going to ask them, what do you want done with this? We're going to survey it and possibly subdivide it. And I usually don't do a lot of value add. I usually try and just flip it. Mm -hmm. But this one, I think there's some plenty of meat. Wow. Sounds like you got a lot going on, bro. That's amazing. So you wholesaled, right? Yeah, I, I wholesaled for a long time, for a, for a long time. Res residential, correct? Yeah, houses, and then it turned into land. And a lot of these, I would assign the contract on my land deal. And that's how I was able to build up my bank account. How, that's how I was able to get out of debt because I was in massive debt in 2016. You know, I could barely afford the postcards. What happened to get you in debt? Did you, or is it because you were flipping? Was it, uh, I don't want to get too personal on you, but. Yeah, no, I bought a bunch of rental properties. That first one was in 2007. And I really learned through the gutter with that one. I, I had to huh. evict over three different tenants. And I learned that you're not supposed to charge at the top of the market. People with good credit scores, they don't have to pay high rent. Yeah. Like, so that was one thing I learned, uh, better background checks, never rent to someone that had a felony in their past, but I was oh desperate. God. Like I had to get that thing rented out like that $900 a month mortgage, or actually it was, I was getting 950. My mortgage payment was 750. That mm -hmm. 750 was a lot for me. So I was like, get someone in there quick. And then yeah. things were constantly breaking like the septic system and the roof was leaking and the water heater. And then in 2013, I had that itch. I got back in the real estate because I took that little break during those deployments to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and I was out of the country, I bought another fixer up in 2013, another one in 2014, and then a triplex in 2015. And then these are all fixer uppers. And I accumulated so much debt. My mm -hmm. Amex was maxed out my capital one, my home Depot card, and my credit score was starting to go down. I was starting mm -hmm. to get fearful because I had a, a clearance with the yeah. military and I'm like, Oh my God, like I'm going to lose my clearance. And then they're going to demote me. Like all these negative things were going on in my mind. So I had to find, figure out a way to pay off this debt plus make enough money to get out of the military. Cause I didn't want to do a third combat deployment. I was tired of being away from home. Wow. Wow. So you were able to get out of debt because of land. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So we all know, I mean, I, I don't necessarily just say, hey, re wholesale residential, like that's where most people start, but it's just the, the exit strategy of wholesaling is a good strategy, in my opinion, like finding something at a discount, but you, you've seen the issues with wholesaling residential and that's why you went to um, land, correct? Yeah, I was spending a fortune sending out postcards and I was in a highly competitive market. I was in Colorado Springs mm -hmm. and I would send out these postcards and then it'd be time to go to the field to prepare for whatever deployment or whatever we were training for at that time. So no one was answering the phones. So this money was literally, I would have been better off just going out in the street and handing it to just, just handing it out. Burning that ish, bro. Literally. And I was searching for answers. I had just listened to the four hour work week. And I was really just afraid to leave again. I didn't want to leave my, like this time there was children involved and I didn't want to leave my family for another year and a half. Cause what a lot of people don't, don't realize is when you go on a deployment for a year or nine months, there is a training regimen before that for about a year. So you're in the field for about a year, then you deploy for about a year. So you're basically gone for two years almost. And like, my fear was like, man, I'm going to get, I'm going to go through another divorce. This time there's children involved. So I was just like hyper-focusing on how can I make enough money to support me and my family so I don't have to be in the military any longer. And that's how you got it done. Got it done. Like I was getting up at 4 a.m. I was time blocking. I was like my lunch breaks, like I didn't go and eat lunch. I like crammed a sandwich while making phone calls to, to landowners and, and talking to land buyers. And then at night when we put the baby down, like I'd go back to work. Literally, I just threw away. I had some, uh, man, I had to reach in my garbage can. I found some handwritten letters that I had written so long ago that I didn't even get mail. Bro, how does that make you feel to look back and be like, wow, bro, that's where I started with that handwritten. <laughs> yeah, me and my it's wife cool would go down in the back. basement and write these things at nighttime, you know. Wow. So she was a part of it too then, huh? She was at the very beginning. And, uh, you know, we, she doesn't, she doesn't do much with it now other than like, listen to me complain. And what I realized, like, we got to be careful with, as entrepreneurs, like one day she said, you know what, you just tell me when the deals fall through and the negative things. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I don't tell her about the nine positive things that yeah. happened that day. I only tell her about the one negative and it was like weighing on her. Wow. Well, have you heard of the book called The Gap in the Gain? 
No, I'm going to write by, that down, though. Yeah, by Dan Sullivan um, and uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy. He just came out with another book called 10X. What do you, you got? Uh, Who Not How? Yeah. Yes, sir. So they, yeah, they came out with a gap in the game. They just came out with another one called 10X is Easier Than 2X. So basically the gap in the game refers to like focusing on your um, where you've come from, like uh, the gain that you've achieved versus just focusing on the gap of what you haven't. And that if you're able to do that, your uh, your mindset's going to be like freaking unstoppable, bulletproof. So that, man, that, I'm going to read them you, both. Yeah, you'll love it, man. I just finished uh, the gap. No, sorry. 10X is uh, Easier Than 2X that just came out money bro it's freaking dope so uh tell tell the the painless wholesaling nation the people the listeners what they can do to to learn how to get in the land because I, I can't help them i i mean yeah i would send them to you so what, what yeah you i mean every single day i do a video on tiktok uh you can find me on tiktok at brent l bowers one uh, I talk about how to make money in land. I've got my YouTube channel. I'm talking about how to make money in land. Brent L. Bowers. Uh, I got my Instagram channel, Brent L. Bowers. Like I am like, like with the loudest, I'm trying to be as loud as possible, showing people like this is a great opportunity. Like so many people are going past this, like, and there's virtually no competition in this business. And I teach people how to do this. And, and I've heard people ask, well, why are you giving away the secrets? Like, aren't you creating your own competition? And I used to be the same way when I went to these real estate seminars in 2004 and 2005. I'm like, why is this guy, if he's doing so well, he's wearing a Rolex and all, but why is he giving me all these secrets? Here's what I learned. When you create a community and you give away all your secrets, just because I take a piece of the pie doesn't mean there's less for you, Nathan. Right. And like, I'm sure I like your listeners are probably thinking bull crap. Like no, that's, that's true, not brother. true. Well, now that I have created this community with other sharks, other land sharks, there's lending in the community. There's guys buying deals. I literally just did 28 lots with one of my so-called competitors that I created. 28 yeah. lots. We split. We did assign those. We assigned that contract. We just split $22,000. And guess what? He got those 28 lots in my market, my farm area. He called me. He's like, hey, I haven't been able to sell these. You got a buyer? I said, I don't know. Maybe. So we sent them out and we had one buyer. He fell through. The next one purchased it. Bro, I freaking love it. The community, everyone that's listening, again, we tell you these things not because of scarcity, but it's just like we there's an abundance of act out there. So if we can work together, we can get more done 100%. Well, um, so they got you on TikTok. We got you on Instagram. We got you on YouTube. You heard it here first, people. If you want to get into land, if you want to forget residential, you go right to land. You're going to be successful. That's the way to go. I honestly think that, uh, you know, doing it the way he's saying, be transparent, honest. That's why I like working with you, Brent, because you can just tell the way you do business is the right way to do business. So reach out to him if you're interested in getting the land. Love it. Brent, is there any other thing you want to leave the listeners with, uh, like a gold nugget? Anything you want to say before we dip out? Yeah, I mean, go out. I mean, there's so much. Like, you give so much value on this, Nathan. You told me that the actual guest you just had before me, like, I'm going to go back and listen to that one. <laughs> Yeah. But, that guy's but, wild, bro. Yeah. but I had my notebook, like I wrote like four sentences of what you said, but when you're listening to these podcasts with all this gold or YouTube or whatever it is, maybe it's the who not how book, write one sentence down that you want to implement within like the next day or so. And then the next step is go in time block, like write something in your calendar. Like I'm going to get up early tomorrow or stay up late. If you're not, an, if you're a night owl, like stay up late and get it done within 24 hours. Like Tony Robbins says, never leave the scene of a goal without like actually taking some action towards it. So just take action, you know, stop, just get out of freaking education mode. I hate when people say, you know, yeah. I'm an education mode right now. How long have you been in education mode? Like almost five years, right? Yeah. Well, I found myself in education mode from 2004 to about 2000. I don't think I really was successful until about 2013 in, in real estate. So 2004 to 2013, that's nine years. Get the yeah, heck bro. out of education mode and call me. I'll, I'll help you. 863-801-6959. That's my cell phone number. Leave me a message if I don't answer. Or text there you me. go. You heard it here first. Hit him up. He's 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 telling he just gave you a cell phone. So I love it. Hey, Brent, uh, thanks again for uh, coming on. And uh, we'll have to have you on in the future. See how you're doing in, the, in you know, a couple months. God bless me. All right. Later, everybody.